some of these contact cards on your seat or near your seat. I would just say, um, if you're new here, we'd love to uh, get to know you a little better. Uh, if you want to put your name on there, if you're somebody that comes here often, you can put prayer requests on there. First time, I love praying for people by name and for specific needs. So that's something that uh, we definitely want to have you guys fill out. You can just put that um, in the offering plate as it comes by. That's no problem. And um, we'd love to hear from you guys. I want to welcome everybody watching on Facebook Live. It's good to see you here this morning. Well, I don't see you, but I know you're there. So thanks for being with us here this morning. And then you guys maybe will see this by your seat. Just This is just something you can put on your refrigerator door. We're doing something uh, in this city We want to be outside of this, you know, local church on Sunday mornings. We want to be strengthening our local community through strengthening individuals and the family unit. And so something that we've done is we've partnered with the Boys and Girls Club, local organization here, and they actually have a a program 4.30 to 6.30 on June uh, 13th is a Wednesday, and we're going in there. We're doing that once a month. We've already done one. There's about 70 kids that show up. These kids are are awesome. They need to see uh, people wrapping their arms around, loving on them. We played football. I injured myself. It was a wonderful, wonderful time. Um, But we played soccer. Uh, Some people just sat down and played board games. We cooked them hot dogs and just had fun with them. So anybody's welcome to that. Um, it's, it's all the information's on this card. If you need to know anything more, let me know. But we want to just, we want a lot of people to be there just to show these kids love. So participate in that if you can. I know it's kind of an awkward time, that 4.30 to 6.30, but if you can make it, it would be wonderful. We'd love to see you there. So now uh, we're just going to continue on to our worship. This is a time where we, uh, we are, uh, believe in being a generous church, uh, generous people. And so God has, has called us to be generous and, and with our finances to, to give to him what he has given to us. And so this is just a time that we continue to worship and celebrate. And so I'm going to pray for that offering time. And then we're going to get into a message today. And I got to be honest with you guys. Today, I have not been nervous to preach in a long time. But today, I'm nervous. And uh, it's because God threw a little twist on me. And uh, I'll tell you that here in a minute. But we'll see what happens. Either it's going to be awesome or it's going to be the worst service you've ever been a part of. I'm just saying that straight up. So there we go. Let's pray. Lord, we love you so much. We thank you for an awesome awesome place to be able to worship you this morning here at the Clyde Ironworks. We pray for all the workers, the owners, the leadership here at the Clyde. We just lift them up to you. Bless them wherever they're at, whatever their belief is. Lord, we just want you to bless them where they're at. Give them favor in their lives and and continue. Thank you that you give them opportunities to see you, Jesus. We pray for each and every individual here that you would speak to them today, that you would meet them right where they're at, that they would know that they're loved right where they're at but that you don't want to leave them where they're at, that you want to move them forward in a powerful, powerful way. We thank you for the volunteers that showed up this morning to prepare this service and, and with a love in their heart, a love for you and, and, uh, and a love for people, that they were just so willing to dedicate their time and their effort and their energy to get us where we need to be here this morning. And Lord, we just thank you that you're a God that is alive and present and you're with us now. Be with us the rest of this time. We give you this message today. We give you this time. We give you our lives. We pray this in your name. Amen. You're just in time. I believe I've isolated the algorithm for making friends. <laughs> Sheldon, there is no algorithm for making friends. Well, well, hear him out. If he's really onto something, we could open a booth at Comic-Con, make a fortune. <laughs> My initial approach to Kripke had the same deficiencies as those that plagued Stu the Cockatoo when he was new at the zoo. Stu the Cockatoo? Yes. He's new at the zoo. It's a terrific book. I've distilled its essence into a simple flow chart that will guide me through the process. Have you thought about putting him in a crate while you're out of the apartment? Hello, Kripke. Yeah, Sheldon Cooper here. It occurred to me that you hadn't returned any of my calls because I hadn't offered any concrete suggestions for pursuing our friendship. Yeah, perhaps the two of us might share a meal together. Yeah, I see. Well, then perhaps you'd have time for a hot beverage. Popular choices include tea, coffee, cocoa. I see. No, 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 wait, don't hang up yet. But what about a recreational activity? I bet we share some common interests. You tell me an interest of yours. You, really? On actual horses? <laughs> tell me another interest of yours. 
Oh, no, I'm sorry. I have no desire to get in the water till I absolutely have to. <laughs> Tell me another interest of yours. Uh-oh, he's stuck in an infinite loop. I can fix it. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, but isn't ventriloquism by definition a solo activity? <laughs> yeah. I mean, tell me another interest of yours. Hmm. Is there any chance you like monkeys? <laughs> yeah, what is wrong with you? Everybody likes monkeys. <laughs> Hang on, Kripke. A loop counter and an escape to the least objectionable activity. Howard, that's brilliant. I'm surprised you saw that. <laughs> Gee, why can't Sheldon make friends? <laughs> All right, Kripke, that last interest strikes me as the least objectionable, and I would like to propose that we do that together. Tomorrow. Yes, I'll pay. <laughs> All right, goodbye. All right. Time to learn rock climbing. <laughs> Oh, that's good stuff. Everybody has that friend that will only do something if uh, if someone else is paying, right? That's kind of kind of me, um, Sheldon. That that's just funny. So, yeah, we've been in a we've been in a discussion about friending, and and it's uh, we've been talking about show me your friends, I'll show you your future, and I had just studied all week for this this uh, sermon that was gonna you know just build you up and and change lives, and then. I get here this morning, I start moving around, and God just starts stirring something on my heart. And so that whole, uh, we're one community away from changing our destiny, is probably what's going to be preached next week, because we're going to just move on to something that I just feel like God has on my heart here this morning. But friends, um, friends are so vital in our, our life, aren't they? I mean, really, like, I, I can really put uh, any of my successes in life, like real successes, are because of positive people or, or somebody that has been around me that has been such an influence. And I can also think of the times that are 100% my fault when I found myself in a, in a sticky situation or in trouble. And it's usually because of, of the influences around me, of, of others and things like that. Now, I'm not saying that I don't make my own decisions or we don't do that, but it definitely matters who's in our life. It definitely matters who we put around us. So if you guys want to hear about this uh, uh, one community away from, from uh, changing your life, changing your destiny, talking about the, the local church and, and talking about the, the people and the friends that you have around, come next week. We'll talk about that. But today, I'm going to open up God's Word and I'm just going to let Him speak to us here this morning because that's what I feel like He wants us to do. So let's just pray really quick. Lord, we love you here today. We understand that more than anything, I pray that we understand that you're a real God that's alive right now. You're very tangible, that you want a relationship with us, that you're not somebody that's just off far away. You're not an idea. You're not a feeling. You're not a goosebump on a goosebump. You're not just the wind blowing in the leaves, but you're, you're present in our lives, that you're physical, and that you want us. And whatever you want to do through this message today, Lord, I pray that our hearts are open to that. I pray right now that we take all of our experience and we just set it aside for a moment. We take all our hurts and all our pains. We just, it's a hard helmet to take off, but that we would just take that aside and we would be filled with you, your goodness, and your truth. We pray this in your name. Amen. All right, well, I hope I know what I'm doing here this morning. <clears throat> so I want to start to talk about a scene in the Bible. It's early on, you know, God creates the heavens and the earth, and, and it's just this awesome, awesome thing. And we see that God is good. The things that he brought on earth was this, this good, good God. He brought, he brought uh, Adam and Eve, you know, the first humans. It's, it's just an awesome, awesome scene, right? And, and so Eve is out, you know, we just don't go very long in, in at least the Bible, I mean, I don't know time-wise, like, how, how this actually was, but we don't go very long before our humanness kind of gets in the way, and our pride and our selfish, selfishness kind of gets in the way. And there's this scene, and Eve is sitting out in the open under this tree, and a serpent comes and starts to have a discussion with her. Now, right there, What? Like, how many of us have had discussions with serpents? And if you have, come up here at the end of service. We're going to lay hands on you, pray with you, and like all that stuff, right? I mean, this is a wild scene. 
Sometimes we need to like really get there and just be like, okay, I, that takes some faith to understand that. But for whatever reason, as you read through scripture, you see that there was a relationship in this, in this garden, this perfect place that God created. There was a relationship between plants and animals that's just different than we have now. See, because we're, we're cursed now, and we'll get into that in a moment. But Eve is having this conversation with the serpent, and the serpent, in case some of you maybe haven't figured it out or won't figure it out, is the enemy, the devil. He's real. He roams around this earth looking for someone to devour, and, and on this day, he chooses Eve. And I just want to read a story, and we'll talk about it here in a minute. It's, uh, it's out of Genesis 3, if you guys want to read on this at, at some point. Um, it says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from the tree in the garden? See, God placed them in this garden, and he says to them, There's, just, there's one thing that I want you guys to stay away from, for your benefit, for your good. There's a tree in the middle of this garden, the tree of life, and I I don't want you to eat from the fruit of that tree. So he puts that out there because we have a good God, and he knows what's best for us. And he says to Adam and Eve, just don't do that. But the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And he knew that this was the way. He was crafty. He was a schemer. And so he came in a form, get this, that wouldn't have freaked Eve out. Some people think like, I mean, I know me, I'm just going to be honest with you. I like to be kind of like manly, but I see a snake and you're going to hear a little squeal out of me. Like, ah, you know, like I don't, uh uh-uh. Like even like gardeners and stuff, like I'll have my wife take care of that kind of stuff. Like, no, thank you. Snakes are not my thing. No. But for whatever reason, this was not scary or a weird scenario to Eve. This was kind of something normal. And that's what we have to like really wrap our minds around. He came in a crafty way. He came in a way that that she would recognize and she wouldn't shun away from. Understand that point as we move on. So he says to her, he starts to question God's word. He starts to question like what he really said. Did he really say this? And, 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 And he says, did God really say you must not eat from the tree in the garden? He starts to question God's word. Moving on. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat from the fruit... Uh, of the trees of the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. So you can have your heyday, feast up if you want, but this one particular tree, this one particular tree you must not eat from, and you must not touch it or you will die. Here comes the serpent in his craftiness. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, questioning God's word again, his truth, his goodness, his reliability. He's working doubt into her life. The serpent said to the woman, For God knows that when you eat from this, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Well, that might be so, but there's something that God wanted to protect us from, wanted us not to see, right? And so he goes on, it goes on and it says, When the woman saw the fruit of the tree of the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye. And now she has all these little thoughts in her head that the serpent did. She took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then, their eye, then the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized they were naked. They realized, they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Now here it is. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid. They hid from God among the trees of the garden, but the Lord God called out to the, to the man, where are you? The man answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. This is a story that's just not uncommon to us. Like, that sounds like something that you, you hear only in Sunday school or something like that. Maybe when you were younger, for those of you that are churched, or, or you hear this, you know, that's just like, oh yeah, like we know about the fall, you know, Eve ate the fruit. And, but what's happening there is something that happens in our lives on a daily basis. See, 
we walk around oftentimes and the enemy shows himself in ways that we just don't think he's present in. Well, it's the computer and I'm alone and nobody's around, so what's this really hurting, right? I'll just look at what I want to look at. Nobody knows, nobody cares, nobody sees, nobody's going to get hurt by this. You know, or it's just a little bit of gossip and that's not really going to hurt my life or it's my money, God, I'll do what I want with it. It's my life, don't tell me how to live. He presents himself in crafty ways. It may not be a serpent in a tree talking to us, but he gets us to doubt God's word. He gets us to doubt God's word in our lives, just like he did. Did, did God really say that? Did God really say, I mean, it's 2018. Did God really say no sex before marriage? I mean, would he do, like, that's not cool. That's not hip. That's not the thing now. Did God really say that? Did God really tell us to guard our hearts and to take every thought captive? I mean, that's a lot of thoughts in my mind every, every day. Did God really tell us that he had a plan for our finances? I mean, it's my finances. I work hard for it. And, and the church is just trying to do something on their own, right? So they're trying to get something from me. He's crafty. See where the division comes in? It's just like when a little bit of water gets in a, in a crack and then the freeze comes and it pops it open even more. I mean, he's just so crafty. He gets into places where, where we're just not ready, we're not protected. And this particular day, Eve wasn't ready. And what happens, why that's so scary and why I bring that up and why that's so dangerous is not to put anybody to shame here, by the way. Man, life is hard. And by the way, a relationship with Jesus is not about rules at all. It's not about you doing something better. It's about realizing that you're really not strong enough to do that better, but that you give her, him permission to be your strength and your weakness. So it's okay. We're all messy. We all mess up. And that's why we hold on to scriptures that say, while we were enemies with him, he died for us. And we hold on to that and we say, thank you, Jesus. This is why we worship him. Because that grace that he provides for us is something we can't earn, we don't deserve, it's a free gift. But what happens in our life, why this is so important, is that just like Adam and Eve, when we allow a little bit of worry, when we allow that shame, when we allow that guilt, when we allow that sin into our lives, what it starts to do is push us farther and farther away from God. God was pursuing Adam and Eve. He was walking around the garden saying, where are you? But because of their sin in their life, because of their shame, because of the guilt that came on them in this moment, they decided to hide away. Like, man, I don't know, is God really good? Is he waiting to, you know, ground me or something like that? Is he just all about this rule like we ate from the tree? Now they're afraid. And that's what sin does in our lives. See, there's a lot of us in here today, and maybe you're here today. I don't know who this is for or the group of people it might be for. But maybe that hiding has looked like, you know what, the church, the, a group of people hurt me at one time. And so I stay away from that. I hide from it because I don't want to be hurt again. Or I find myself, I don't go into relationships because that I know that God has for me, that, that God strategically put people around, but I isolate myself because I'm, I'm fearful and, I, and I'm hiding now. I'm not sure what's going to happen. But who we're really hiding from and what we're really hiding from is God. Let's call it what it is. We're scared. We're not sure that he's... We're questioning, like, is he really a good God? Does he really know who I am? Does he really see all of me? Because if he did, surely I'm doomed. And that is right where the enemy wants you today. That's right where that serpent wants you. He wants you to doubt the goodness of God. He wants you to doubt the word of God, the promises of God. And he wants you to believe that there's no hope. We have to battle against that in our lives every day. So how do we do that? We do that by looking in Scripture and understanding the Word of God. I mean, this is just so amazing. I'll, I'll, I'll turn to it. It's Jeremiah 29, 11. This is a, just a great verse to hang on to. 
But this is the God that we serve. This is the God that, that said, don't touch fire because it's going to burn. And they did it anyhow. But he says, it's all good. I, I love you so much. I created you. I'm proud of you. I want you. I want this life with you. I, I'm not worried about what you've done. I see who you can be. And I just want to be present in your life. And he says, this is the God. If you've ever doubted the goodness, you know, listen to this verse. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. He has plans for you. He has a purpose. The number one question I get as a pastor is, I'm not sure I know my purpose. Not sure I have a purpose. You have a purpose. God has a plan for you and your life. And here is that plan. Plans to prosper you. Not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a good future. Show me your friends. I'll show you your future. A life without God, I would imagine, has to be filled with hopelessness. Has to be filled with fear and hiding and isolation. But a life with God, stepping into that life with God, promises hope. Promises to prosper and not materialistic all the time. But plans of a good future. In other words, he's saying, I'm a God you can trust. My word is true. And I did say, don't eat from the garden because the wages of sin, or don't eat from the tree in the garden, the wages of sin is death. And I don't want death with you. It's, the wages of sin is like an eternal separation. From me, this good God that loves you and pursues you and wants you. And my plan is that you have a future, that you have an eternity in heaven with me. It's going to be glorious. Hundreds of angels and all kinds of stuff. I mean, things that we can't even imagine. It's amazing. And this God wants you to know I have good plans for you. He doesn't stop there. He, he gives us a way. See, that, that wage of sin was death. And there was no saving ourselves. We couldn't do it. So it took a man. It took a man. His name was Jesus. i got to learn my Bible a little better. I'm, fine. I'm missing out on verses here. Here we go. Um, his name was Jesus. And he created this way for us to be out of that burden, that, that curse of sin in our lives to where we can be free from that. He provided a way. And it says this, this you want to question the goodness of God right now? Are you in a place in life where you're wondering like, man, I just don't know. Like, I get it. It's good for some people, but I don't know if God really cares about me that way. I don't know if he's really provided a way for me. Like, I see it working. I mean, Pastor Josh is fired up this morning, and his life's changed, and I see people next to me, and their life's changed, but I'm not sure that's for me. And I just read Jeremiah 29, 11, that he has a specific plan for you, that he has a life for you that wants to prosper you. And it goes on to say, you want to question his goodness? You can't because his word is true. And it says this in John three sixteen, through whenever we stop here. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. The thing that is dearest to him, his one and only son, that whoever, whoever, all believe in him shall not perish, shall not have the reality that the wages of sin is death, but they'll have eternal life. Okay, but then it goes on and it says, For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. Well, but did God really say that? I mean, look at what you were doing last night. Look at who you were with. Look at where your thoughts are and your attitude. Look where your marriage is at this morning, right? This is where the enemy has you. Look how you're parenting. You know your secret life and your thoughts. Did he really send his son for you? That's the enemy spitting lies into your life. You have to cut that off. Because the truth is, is that he sent his son into the world not to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. You want to question God's goodness? He looked at his creation that, that turned their back on him that turned away, that, that hid from him. And he says, 
I don't care about that. I love you so much that I want to provide a way. I, I'm not coming here with this message. I'm not, I'm not physically here on earth when, when Jesus was here to tell you how bad you are at life, to tell you that you need to cut your hair, that you need to you know, dress a certain way, that you need to learn how to stand up, sit down, and hooray, hooray, hooray. It's not about like this religion type of a thing. I'm here to tell you that I didn't come to condemn your life. I didn't come to point out all these sins. I came to show you that there's a life through believing in me and putting your trust in me. That there is a future. If you feel broken and dead and ashamed and guilty and in pain, there's a future with me. I'm the fountain of living water, and whoever comes to drink, this fountain doesn't run out. It just keeps coming. So as you grow, I will continue to pour more and more and more in you. He did not come to condemn the world, but to save the world. And it says this, but whoever, this is the truth of Scripture. It has to be the whole thing. So that's good. That's the stuff that's awesome. But there's a reality here, too, that it continues on. And it says, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because, not because God's bad, but, but because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict Light, Jesus, when they talk about life, they're talking about Jesus, has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of the light. Can you see that in our culture? We, we love the darkness. Don't tell me how to live my life. Don't tell me that there's a better way. Who are you to tell me? You're judging me. I'm not judging you. I'm just saying that there's a better way. There's life. There's a good future. There's something more than all of this. And it comes with knowing him. But people hold on to that darkness. They hold on to that guilt. They hold on to that shame. They hold on to that sin because they've bought into this lie. But people love the darkness instead of the light because of their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for the fear their deeds will be exposed. And my fear is that that's where a lot of us are today. That's where a lot of us are today, and I want to I do my best to, to just plow through that lie that you're like stuck because you're in some kind of sin or this reoccurring thought or this guilt or this doubt comes in. You're not stuck there. It, right here it says that the reason that they fear coming to Jesus is because they don't want to just like be exposed like it's all going to be out in the open now. Well, God already knows God knew Adam and Eve were in the garden hiding. He didn't have to like call out to where they were. He wanted to give them an opportunity to confess what they did so that he could forgive. And there was consequences of that, and that's scary for us. Some of us are sitting in the consequences of our sin. Broken relationships, broken marriages, right? Relationships at work not going well because it's just, you know, we're not, we're not willing to give. There's pride issues there. We've, we get so scared and the enemy, he keeps us right there. He's so crafty and we, we think that we're strong enough, but we're not. We think that we're strong enough to, to sin and be able to just come out of it. But he's so crafty and he keeps us there and it just weighs and it weighs and it weighs and it weighs and eventually we find ourselves in a spot so far away from God that we don't even know who we are anymore. And this is how God provided another way. So you say like, man, with all that, how do I even know if I'm saved? Well, listen, it, we all make mistakes here, right? There, there's mistakes and then there's just this continuing, I am going to choose to sin against God because that's what I'm going to do. And I don't believe that there's anybody in here that's like that. Please don't prove me wrong, but I don't think there is. I think that we're all fallible human beings that make mistakes and we're tempted and we give in once in a while and it breaks us down and we're weak and, and it goes back and forth. You want to know how you're saved in Romans 10, 9, it just says this. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Jesus, he's the Lord of my life. I want you to be the boss. I want to I look more like you. I want to work and I, wanna, I want to 
put my trust in you and, and believe that your ways are better than my ways. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, he's the boss of your life, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The question is, have you done that and do you believe that? Have you confessed with your mouth? I mean, you know, we don't have to all stand up right now and Jesus is Lord. I mean, that would be kind of cool here this morning, but like we don't have to do that. But have you done that? Have you confessed that Jesus is the boss of my life and, and even when it doesn't look very good to me, even when that, that fruit in that garden looks really tasty, I'm going to do his will. I'm going to put him first and I'm going to come alongside him in life. Have you confessed that with your mouth? And do you truly believe that God's power raised his son from the dead three days after he died for our sins and he's alive right now in heaven and that you can have a, a real relationship with him? Do you believe that? Then you can know. Being saved is not the secret. It's not this like, man, I don't know, I kind of had a bad day or I... I Kind of flip that guy off because he cut me off in the par you know, parking lot. That doesn't make you unsaved. That just makes you a guy that I probably drove by because I'm a horrible driver and I probably cut you off. <laughs> Do we know these things? We have to. These are, these are decisions that we can't just kind of dodge around and be like, well, I'll just come next week and wait for a message that's easier. This is the gospel. This is a decision that we all have to make. But here's the awesome thing. And this is all close within the next, you know, hour and a half to two hours. You guys got time. It's all good. But this is what I'll kind of close up with. Because God gave us, he gave us Jesus to recognize that we're not stuck in our sin. To realize that we don't have to hide from this good God. That he, he pursues us. He wants us right where we're at. But he doesn't want to leave us where we're at. He gave us a way to strengthen ourselves. Peter was this um, disciple of Jesus, and you guys might have heard of him. If you haven't, he was, he was a fisherman, uneducated. Society kind of counted him out. And Jesus says, you come with me. You're following me. I see something in you. I see the potential. And he follows Jesus for years and sees all these miraculous things. And then just like any good friend, when Jesus gets stuck and he gets betrayed and he's getting beaten, he denies him three times. He says, whoa, that's not my friend. I'm going to go this way. But Jesus didn't give up on Peter because Jesus rose again three days later. He found Peter and he says, Peter, man, I love you. Do you love me? Peter says, yeah. And they have this conversation and, and Jesus brings Peter back to him and says, listen, I know the enemy in these three days must have been beating you up and like you deserted me. You gave up on me. And I believe Satan was telling you in your mind and your heart, he's just trying to whisper lies to you that I don't love you anymore and how could a good friend betray. And think about what Peter must have been going through in those three days, the torture. And Jesus says, I don't care about that. You're more important to me than that betrayal. You're more important to me. And I died for you. And I love you. Do you love me? I mean, man, what a friend to have in Jesus. So we have that and. Peter gets all excited one day and he's out preaching to like 3,000 plus people. And he's just telling them what I'm just telling you, like there's sin and, and, and the wages of sin is death and the gift of God is eternal life and woohoo! And all these people, they stand up. Man, I really wish I would have known where I was. See what I mean? Like when you don't prepare anything, you just kind of... Oh man, of course. He's preaching to these people. And, and they ask him, they say, so what shall we do? Like, they're like, man, I, I want in on that. I see that, that God is good, that I don't have to live this life of sin. I don't have to live in shame. Like, what must I do? And Peter says, it's simple. You repent. And you turn to God, and he talks about being baptized. He says, you need to be baptized, you need to repent. And that's what we do. So have you confessed with your mouth that Jesus is Lord? Have you believed in your heart that God has the power to raise him and that he's alive right now? And are you willing to repent? And what repent means is that you have this sin right here. And you say, you know what? It's been holding me down. It's been making me hide from God, my friends, 
uh, the church, relationships, whatever. It's been holding me down. And the lie has been that I need that. I need that for my, my own pleasure. I need that to fulfill me. I need whatever that is, I need it, and I'm bound to that. That's the lie that you've been believing. And repentance says, no more. I'm going to choose God, and I'm not just going to stop doing that, and I'm not just going to feel bad because I got my hand caught in the cookie jar type of a thing. I'm going to turn away from that and look on it no more because God has plans for me, a good future to prosper me. He, he's taking me somewhere, but this is keeping me where I'm at, and I'm stuck in it and it's filth, and it's gunk, and I've been believing even that maybe it's God doing this to me, but I realize that God's a good God, and he wants me to go somewhere. So I repent, I turn away from that, and I don't look on it anymore. That's repentance. It's truly walking away. But then Peter knows, man, like, we're never meant to be alone in this world. God saw Adam and said, hey, I'm going to make you a helpmate here because it's not good for man to be alone. We're, we're relational human beings. We were created that way. We also weren't created for pain. We were created perfectly not to know how to handle pain, which is why everybody in here has no clue how to handle pain. We handle it in so many different ways, and it takes us down so many different roads. I see it all the time because we were not meant to carry that, which is why I love Scripture that says, when we are weak, he is strong. He is perfect in that weakness. The sooner you understand you weren't created for that and it's a hard thing to handle, the better off you'll be because you'll start looking to God and you'll start looking to what Peter starts talking about in Acts 42. He says, these people, by the way, 3,000 people that day said, I want Jesus. 3,000 people. I mean, talk about your startup church. My goodness. 3,000 people. And this is, what, this is what they did. This is the important part that we cannot miss, that our culture is trying to get us farther and farther away from, is this. 42, it says, they devoted themselves. So those people that just said, okay, we believe. There's the church now, right? We, we believe in this. We believe in God. We, we, we want to repent from our sins. We want to be baptized. We want a new life with Jesus. We're new creations in Jesus. This is awesome. It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching teaching and to fellowship they got together they cared for one another and that's how they did it to the breaking of bread and prayer they prayed together everyone was filled at awe, in awe at the many wonders and the signs performed by the apostles all the believers were together and had everything in common they shared things in common they sold their property and possessions and gave to anyone who had need that's a crazy thought to us. What does that look like? And I'm not saying, like, let's all go out and sell our property. I need my house. Um, every day, check this out. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes, and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. God did some incredible things. There was good plans and a good future. It, it, it went somewhere. And here is the greatest thing that I read out of this entire book of Acts, I think, is that by all of this, it says, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Those that were hiding at one point, feeling ashamed, feeling guilt, living in their sin, and, and came to new life in Christ and understood this good God and the relationship that they can have with Jesus. Daily, those who are being saved. So Peter understood this idea that, that it's not something like, yes, we have this individual, very personal, intimate relationship. Like God wants to know us, and he wants us to know him. But then he says, I want you to be with people that are common heart, common mind. I want you to get to know each other. Not just because we want to have a church that's like friendly and, and a place where people can go, but I want to have an effective church a body of believers that impacts a community, that impacts the world. And the only way to do that is together. Because you're going to come up against hard times when you're not believing in yourself. You're going to come up against times when you just don't have the energy to move on the next day. And that's where being together and sharing in common heart and common mind and meeting together and being prayed for is what's going to strengthen you. It's going to be your belief in me. And it's going to be your trust in others. 
And man, has the enemy done a good job. We don't trust anybody anymore. We don't trust teachers. Look at all the sexual stuff happening out there in schools with teachers, women and men. It used to just like you only heard about men. Now it's women. We don't trust, we don't trust people because they're driving buses into people and shooting people up. We don't trust politicians for a number of reasons that I'm not going to talk about or I'll get tomatoes thrown at me kind of thing, but we don't trust them. The doctors, what do they know, right? We've all seen this. We call it other things, but it's, it's the enemy out there seeking to destroy and to kill, to take away that trust. And the one area, the one group of people that has to show our culture how to trust again is the local church. We have to be the example. And we've been shown the way how to do that. It's not, it's not crazy. It's not like we have to do a bunch of weird stuff. It's, it's coming together for a boys and girls club. And just loving on people. You like that little plug? Like now you're all guilted in. Like, oh, now I got to go. I was like part of the, I know what I'm doing once in a while. What can we do when a church looks like that, honestly? What can we do if we move past the hurts of the past of thinking that the church wants to do something weird with your finances? And we just gave. We just gave like we're called to do. What could happen with this local church? What could happen with this local church if somebody on this side meets somebody on that side and they start to trust one another, even if they just know, you know what, I can't trust them with like everything, but I know that those are some, that's somebody that I could go to if I really needed prayer or something like that. What could happen in this local church? What could happen in this city if we were willing to come together and impact this city and not just be a group of people that meets together, but actually go out and be the church together. What would happen if we lined up going down the street, and I'm not talking about protesting, but we sent an army of believers into Duluth? I mean, what would happen to this city? Man, I'm getting too excited for talking up here. I'm, I, it's just amazing to me. It's amazing what could happen, and I see that. I see it so clearly. Number one is because God put a vision on my heart for Duluth, Minnesota, and I believe that he loves this city, just desperately loves this city. And I believe it because we started this church with like eight people at a table right there. And I'm not that cool. I'm not that clever. I don't know how to talk that well, and I don't know how to organize the greatest. And like none of that stuff could have happened because of anything that I did. It's look around and see what God's doing. We had to move into a larger side of the building because people just keep coming. And there's lives that are changing, addictions that are being broken, marriages that are strengthening up, relationships being built where people felt loneliness one time, they're starting not to. I mean, this is exciting. People are wanting to be baptized. What could happen if we stopped hiding from God repented from our sin and started living in that life that he plans for us to prosper. If you guys can, will you stand and pray for me? Or pray pray for me, yeah. Pray with me. (laughs) Goodness gracious. God is so good. It's unbelievable, man. He's, I don't know. Sometimes I just want to go off and say, like, I mean, I just, I know what he's going to do with this church. You know, like, the hardest thing about being a visionary is seeing where God wants to take it and and having to wait to get there. And I'm cool with that. But it's just like, man, I know what God wants to do. I know what he wants to do in the individual hearts of you. I know what he wants to do in me, our leadership, the city. And I am just chomping at the bit to go do it. It's awesome. I thank you guys for being a part of it, so. Let's just trust God. Let's believe that he is good. Let's stop hiding. Let's see where he wants to take us. And you have a church family around you, myself, Pastor Tim, other leaders, people around here that want to see those same things. So talk to them. Get to know them. Let's pray. God, we love you. We love you so much. We thank you that you are a good God. We thank you that you, uh, your word is true, that you... Um, that you pursue us, that you're walking after us and you want us to find you. You want us to know who you are. Um, we just thank you. Thank you so much that you're tangible, that you're real, that you're alive and that you, you desperately want us. Lord, I pray for everybody here. I pray for, I pray for the ones that maybe feel like they're hiding away from you, that they would just recognize how good you are and that they don't have to hide anymore. That's, that's an exhausting life. 
There's freedom when we just come into the light and we say, you know what? God loves me flaws and all. He loves me in my sin. He loves me even as I've been like an enemy of him. He loves me right where I'm at and he wants to take me somewhere. There's freedom in that. We just call out the enemy in our lives that, that he's been telling us lies that we're stuck or that we're no good or that we're, we're worthless or, or that we'll never get over something that we've been struggling with our whole lives. We, we take that lie and we shut the mouth of the enemy right now and we say, you don't know our God. You don't know who he is and what he wants for our lives. You're a liar. Jesus, you say that there's not a word that comes out of his mouth that is true. So we put our trust in you. We put our hope in you. We thank you for what you're doing in this local church and we celebrate what you're going to do in the faith of these people, the trust that they put in you and the work of their hands, the impact that they have on people around them. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. God bless you guys. We'll be downstairs next week. Bring somebody to church. See you next week.